Every NFL Sunday should be like NFL Week 8, Sean. This is the DeAndre Hopkins and Tyreek Hill edition. That is the headline of the article that you have up on rotoviz.com, recapping some of the biggest wide receiver days of NFL Week 8. We'll be talking about some of that, some of the games that we didn't fully touch on on the Monday recap show for NFL Week 8. We'll have much more coming up on today's show, which is brought to you in association with Blue Wire and WinBet. We'll have more on WinBet later on in today's podcast episode Sean the trade deadline is happening as we speak and it was a lot of fun we were deciding do we do the instant reactions today do we is that a stealing bananas episode that is going to be the Wednesday stealing bananas episode to get those reactions to yourself and Ben on what's happening but it's a pretty crazy trade deadline here at the moment as the news filters in it was a case where I kind of thought We'll fit these into today's show, these you know, couple of trades trickling over the line. TJ Hawkinson's a pretty big one that we would have reacted to. But then as we start recording, the, the trades start to really fly in. So we want to make sure that we are not out of the loop completely by the time this episode is released in you know, maybe 80 minutes' time. So looking forward to digesting the, the trade deadline. And we might even fit some parts of it into today's show. But this is going to be... a a fun continuation of our, our recap earlier this week sean was traveling over the last couple of days as well so sean back in his his home surroundings here and looking forward to diving into this one i am we did the sunday night recap show on location which just means in a different room in a different part of the country not <laughs> at any particular nfl stadium or the like colin this was the the coolest week we've had by far in the nfl this season I think it bodes very favorably for what the rest of the year will look like. Seeing all these teams go for it with the trades, also really cool. You have, after a slow start, a lot of teams, some of these teams in the have sort of category, trying to make themselves now Super Bowl contenders, some of the teams in the have-nots moving some players and hoping to get better in the future. It's hard to see how the Lions are accomplishing much other than saving some money to spend elsewhere. But I do think that if you have Amon Ross St. Brown, if you are stashing Jamison Williams in Dynasty, a subtly cool trade for you in that it opens up a path to more volume. One of the reasons we, we liked the Lions and we liked their chances to at some point emerge as not necessarily a Super Bowl contender in the short term, but a team that does make a big jump. You have all of these weapons. They have one less now but it should benefit the two star wide receivers if, in fact, they can continue to build on for Amon Ra what he's done for the first year and a half as a pro, for Williams what he did last year with Alabama, and then obviously DeAndre Swift, not remotely healthy in week eight, looked very sluggish as he tried to take handoffs, run forward. He did have the nice receiving touchdown that moderately saved his day, but once he's back to full strength, they're going to have that trio. We'll see what they do. At quarterback, they'll have slightly upgraded picks. But uh, the trade deadline feels like a continuation of this fantastic week eight. And as the NFL season continues, I think we're going to have a lot more big scores. One of the things that was fun this week is just uh, you needed to participate in it in some way. Obviously, if you have a handful of teams and one of them hit big, that part is fun. But it was also fun just to see big scores across the landscape in general. And if you were in one of these shootouts where you scored big and your opponent scored big, especially if you came out on the, the right end of that. That part of it was a lot of fun. Seeing those points go if you're trying to claw back points, all of that. And in a little bit different mode than in some seasons, we saw some best ball teams take some real jumps. Column, you and I have some teams at the top. We have some teams that aren't doing as well, but we had some teams in the middle or in the like top edge of the bottom third, if that makes sense. So in that eight, nine, 10 range that have made big jumps in the last two weeks and are now in that three, four, five range to where they could potentially continue their move and ideally make the playoffs. So that part also a lot of fun. If you don't have to go in and, and make all of these moves on some of the teams that are in that six to 10 range where you're fighting back and you don't have to live with, well, we're in that six to 10 range. That can be a little bit more emotionally easy as you go forward. You know that the teams in most cases are going to start to build through the buys to watch them do that has been a lot of fun. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, there is always that expectation based on homeward draft. And we're talking about winning the flex, surviving the bye weeks, being able to really, you know, 
hammer your opponents, I guess we'll say at that point, with that strength. And that can be something that, you know, when we're talking week one, week two, week three, maybe some people who haven't drafted that way previously until this year and they're wondering is this going to work and you mentioned some of the teams being in the mid range i had quite a few teams who were in the, the four through six range but this past week i i said to you before we recorded on sunday it felt like a pretty fun week where a lot of the players that we had drafted were really starting to, to hit in that particular week and my lowest score across my ffpc teams this week there was one team that was below 140 points the rest were in kind of that 150 to 180 i had one team put up 199 so there was a lot of jumps this week sean and refreshing those uh you know standings on a, a tuesday morning when that happens is pretty fun so hopefully that is similar for all the folks listening in there i mentioned we are going to head on some of those wide receivers that were in sean's article that posted on tuesday also sean you did a, a monday recap where christian mccaffrey was the the star of that he was kind of the the star of our recap show as well when we did it on sunday but somebody we didn't get to sean that was the new orleans saints they get a big W here. They are now three and five. The Raiders continue to struggle. It was 24 to zero in this one. But the big star coming away from this was Alvin Kamara, who really and truly dominated in this contest. He had 18 rush attempts, 62 yards, one touchdown, also at 10 targets, nine receptions, 96 yards, two touchdowns. So he goes nine for 158 for, in total scrimmage yards and three touchdowns, which is obviously fantastic. Uh, De- Devontae Adams obviously a disappointment for his drafters this week just he has five targets just the one reception for three yards Derek Carr just the 101 yards passing and an interception nothing really going for Josh Jacobs either but Jacobs doesn't get in the game in the second half the team is getting pretty much blown out and they kind of wave the white flag and call it a day um it was 17-0 at halftime Sean what were some of your takeaways from this Alvin Kamara was somebody who was one of those running backs who was you know going later than he shooter this year now that was mainly because of the off the field concerns and the possible suspension that could have came his way he had some games this season where he hasn't looked healthy but the last couple of weeks he he feels like he's really in that full alvin kamara role and and if you're an alvin kamara drafter it doesn't really get much better than this week unless you get that kind of i don't know if it was christmas day or christmas uh, eve six touchdown game a couple of seasons ago but this was pretty electric from kamara it was. And you think about the first month of the season, you think about the mildly slow start that Austin Eckler got off to before the string of 30 point performances. You look at what happened in the first couple of weeks for Christian McCaffrey, for Alvin Kamara, and this huge element of running back receiving production that has always been the key to fantasy scoring that wasn't so much there and you saw some of the other backs really benefit and it starts to look like a season well maybe that profile won't be the skeleton key in 2022 and then as it progresses we've now witnessed some monster scores mainly from Eckler but McCaffrey now definitely getting back in it to where he looks like he will be the trump card in fantasy this year if he can stay healthy, right? But you're still going to have to deal with Austin Eckler, who because the Chargers don't have other passing weapons, because their offense is broken and the dot continues to collapse, he's going to get a lot of targets. They need to use him. And now we're seeing Alvin Kamara here with the Saints. This is peak Alvin Kamara. And I think that one of the main reasons that the team has gone with Andy Dalton as opposed to Jameis Winston is there's just a big split in terms of which quarterback will unlock the biggest weapon that you have. Maybe early in the season where you have Michael Thomas, you have Jarvis Landry, Chris Olave blowing up as this elite threat all over the field, but definitely an air yards dynamo. You're thinking, okay, Winston is the guy who will make this work. But as soon as you lose some of that receiving firepower, it changes completely. And Andy Dalton with Taysom Hill mixed in offers you the both safest path and in a lot of ways, the most fun path, certainly for fantasy managers, it's the most fun path because he's going to be a dump off machine to Kamara, whereas Winston really prefers to push it down the field. We watched how post Drew Brees, Kamara's total opportunity numbers stay very similar, but that rush EP versus receiving EP split went very much in the wrong way to where Kamara was going to have to be even much better than he had been previously in order just to maintain the same types of numbers. In this game, he rushes for 3.4 yards per carry. And so you're thinking to yourself, I mean, that's in and of itself not explosive. 
He does get the short yardage touchdown. That's great to see. Anyone who had Hill was possibly hoping that he would get in on that one or get the opportunity to get in. But in the receiving game here, you're witnessing Kamara, you know, just at his full blown might to where multiple plays here, both of the touchdowns should have been plays where he's tackled by the Raiders. The first one, he actually shows the size and power that he mixes in with that speed and pushes through, reaches the ball across the goal. Multiple guys should have made the tackle there, but he breaks through a hit. The second one is not a physical play, but simply you see the athleticism and the speed there with the Raiders either missing the angle or more or less giving up on the play. The Raiders did not look particularly engaged on defense in the second half. If you can get that mix from him, I mean, you're going to have these three guys, especially now that Jonathan Taylor is injured and they have a quarterback in there that is going to be disastrous for all of the fantasy values for the Colts skill positions. These three guys in terms of Kamara, Eckler, and McCaffrey, I mean, they could blow away the field. Even on a week where we saw Derrick Henry go for over 200 yards and two touchdowns, these three. I mean, this is the trio that will get it done it's possible that with a team like the Saints, they win this game easily. They're still three and five. That puts them completely in the mix in the AFC South. This team isn't strong enough that they're insulated from all the different types of things that might happen. Kamara has been injury prone over the last several seasons, but with Andy Dalton at the helm, I mean, he's going to be an absolute star. It's still tough to take advantage of this in Dynasty if you don't have him. It sounds like, and I don't, I, I don't know that much about it, but it certainly sounds like at some point he is going to face a suspension that could be pretty substantial. So when you look at that and his age, I mean, if you're going to make a move for him, you got to be careful about what you pay. But going down the stretch of 2022, I mean, he really should be one of the stars here. And that's even with Hill vulturing some somewhat high value touches if you had Hill deployed at tight end, we talked about him a month ago or so as someone who, I mean, there's that slight chance still that he would emerge as a tight end matchup type of nightmare to where most teams are not going to be able to get that in there. If you missed on the stars, you could put him in. If you have one of the stars and you've got a little bit thinner somewhere else, maybe you could use him at the flex. I don't like that as much, but he has 12 opportunities in this game, catches a pass, throws a pass, carries 10 times, looks good running the ball, tackled down on the three when he gets a carry inside the 10. It was very close to being one of those big games for Taysom Hill. Again, unless we see some type of real change with the Saints, and they could get healthy in a way where maybe they do decide to go in a different direction, especially if down the stretch they're in the mix to win the division. But right now this is a very encouraging situation for all of them also a game here where Alave he gets the seven targets he only goes five for 52 but within the context of this particular game script I think it's another encouraging performance for him Kamara as I mentioned Sean was one of those players who had a, a hat trick of touchdowns this past week another guy who did that was Tony Pollard there's I have some teams with Tony Pollard I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who drafted Tony Pollard he he was right on the I think he's above for the zero RB candidates would be Sean but he's he's right in that range and he has been one of those guys over the last couple of years so dynasty rosters not will have Pollard on them but he goes 14 for 131 and three and then he gets one target one catch for 16 yards so 147 total scrimmage yards for Pollard disappointing news after the game and it, I, I tend to find, and this is sorry for any Cowboys fans out there, I don't know if they agree or not. I find it pretty disappointing anytime we hear Jerry Jones <laughs> come out with things team related. But he said after the game, we go as Zeke goes. And, you know, he's he's basically, uh, yeah, Zeke should be the, the RB1 here. Try, and I do think there's other owners that may say similar things, but in Dallas, those things kind of end up unfortunately impacting how the games are played. But they really wipe out the Bears in this one's 49 29 at the end. I thought overall Fields didn't look bad in this. I think we're seeing this offense who was extremely bad start to move to usable in terms of the pieces. And I think Fields in terms of having the rushing ability, letting him scramble a bit more has really added to his fantasy value over the last couple of weeks. Big play here that he did mess up on was the Montgomery fumble, which was returned for a touchdown for Dallas, which really did ice the game where you kind of 
the lion runs down he hops over him rather than touches him down and <laughs> gets it returned for about 30 yards for a, a touchdown so pretty bad play there sean when you were writing up your wide receivers this week as well i thought that the big name that was going to highlight that was in keel harry who caught a touchdown in this game but <laughs> <laughs> as we as we joke uh, about that and i know we mentioned the trade deadline his his uh, upside could be a little bit short-lived as chase claypool is now a chicago bear but uh, what was your thoughts on the the Bears Cowboys overall? You're saying Nikhil Harry with his two targets that he's going to uh, lose that upside. He does catch a touchdown here. He looked good in terms of showing off that big body and ability to wall off the defender. You know, people do emerge with their second teams, especially players who maybe had that going for them at some point in the past. The Patriots, I think, were still, even this season, very disappointed that Harry wasn't able to really ever take the jump with them. We've watched the Chicago Bears play some other guys who are washed up, former first-round picks. But joking aside, Justin Fields looked fantastic in this game. He only averaged 6.6 yards per attempt, but he put a lot of balls up in the air, right on the hands of his receivers in the end zone, taking these passes from the the 15, the 20, the 25, the 30, giving them a chance to make some plays in a way where you're probably not going to come down with an interception. Those guys are not able to make those. I mean, the, the target numbers here, they're split between Darnell Mooney, Harry Pettis, Equinemius St. Brown, who catches only one of three and again, doesn't really get anything done. You have Bayless Jones catch only one of three and fail to make what could have been a big play, sort of a game-changing play in this one. You have David Montgomery with the fumble when the Bears were potentially going to get back into it. You also had what would have been a back-breaking fumble from Khalil Herbert, but his was recovered by the Bears. If they're going to have all those handoffs, Herbert and Montgomery have to hold on to the ball. You see the big play from Herbert late in this game uh, after he gets the touchdown sort of more at the midpoint. A game like this, you start to think that maybe he's going to pull away, but we've thought that a number of times in the past where Herbert would distinguish himself. I didn't necessarily think that there was a huge split here. David Montgomery, somebody I'd be going out there and trying to trade for, whether it's with this version of the bears or with the subsequent team at some other point, I think he's a guy who eventually could do what Josh Jacobs has done until this past week for the Raiders. I mean, I've come around on both of those guys. I think that you have to continue to take in the new information Montgomery, not a guy who looks like a star, but could be a very solid RB2 piece for the long term. He's not very expensive right now. He's emerged as a quality NFL player. And so if he gets into a situation where he moves somewhere else, then perhaps you end up with someone who can be a low-end RB1 for two, three years at the running back position. That's pretty meaningful. Fields looked fantastic running the ball himself and consistently brings the team back. I mean, the story of this one is that they're down 28 to 7 they pull back within five, they pull back again another time later, and then you have that fumble returned for the touchdown. As they're trying to come back from that, they run the ball perhaps too much, and you can see the real weakness of the receiving core here because even as they're trying to come back, they have to kind of do it Atlanta Falcons style. But you do get the touchdown to Cole Komet, his first one in over a year. Some very positive things there, but the story here really was – Tony Pollard, because even though this Cowboys team scored a lot, scored quickly, Doc Prescott suddenly looked good. This is the first big game for him for a long time, and it brings back Dalton Schultz. It gives you that floor that you're wanting to see from C.D. Lamb, along with the upside with the touchdown there. Lamb really cementing himself now as a long-term wide receiver one who is going to justify the cost that people paid in startups this year. It doesn't look like a player who necessarily will ever go to that Jefferson chase level. But I mean, the jump that we got from Cooper cup happened midway through the career. You take someone like a CD lamb and you give him a secondary leap off of that. And it gets pretty exciting. But again, the story Tony Pollard, if they don't get those long touchdown runs from him, then this is a competitive game. And I, there are a lot of scenarios. I think if you play this game 10 times, the Bears probably win four. These teams not that different, but the Cowboys starting to become a Super Bowl contender if the offense can take the step. You mentioned Jerry Jones and his talk about Ezekiel Elliott. At this point, I think that's more just to make Elliott feel good and to I mean, not even justify the contract because at a certain point, 
you just seem silly saying that. I don't think that there is too much of a concern there. I mean, they're going to fall back into a committee. There's no way to go about it. Even in this game, I mean, Pollard only carries the ball 14 times. He's not someone who is going to necessarily get a ton of targets. Now they're leading in this game. And so the game script obviously changes compared to what it would be. In a lot of ways, instead of seeing Pollard as Alvin Kamara or Austin Eckler, a back like that, and you watch this game and you're trying to think, I mean, who does he really remind you of? Because Tony Pollard is an elite elite player mentioned on stealing bananas last week with Ben sort of looking forward to this weekend and what would happen that Pollard's after contact numbers for a back who's not particularly big have been extraordinary for multiple seasons this isn't some small sample that's happened recently he does this every time he gets a chance to play and not you know 14 for 131 but he is just a very very good player I think the similarity probably right now would be with Travis Etienne and I always kind of think back to this dynasty offer that Blair Andrews and I got early in the season where we were offered Pollard CEH and a third round pick for Travis Etienne at the point where Etienne is pretty clearly behind James Robinson. That was a tough one to decline because CEH falling into all of these touchdowns, Tony Pollard, you know, you're dreaming of this type of scenario. You get the extra pick. So you have a lot of different ways to win. Whereas the only way that you win on the Etienne side is for what has happened (laughs) <laughs> to happen so you're glad that you held because etn younger he's going to be just a megastar he dominates this game that the jaguars lose <laughs> in some ways this jaguars loss has been the catalyst for them to go pick up calvin ridley i mean they probably wanted him or something like that anyway but it, it's interesting to see them go for a guy who is not going to be available this season whereas the bears add Claypool you think about this game here and how low the target numbers are for all those guys on the Bears side the opportunity for Claypool in terms of target share is obvious in terms of raw targets maybe that's not as good but I think this is going to be great for Claypool maybe not in the short term but in the long term have him on a few dynasty teams where a few weeks ago it just seemed like the value had almost completely and totally vanished you look at it now where he's had a few solid weeks with the Steelers he goes to this offense that I think is going to be an emerging offense over the next 18 months there's some potential there I mean he's a big bodied deep threat who fits well with these jump balls that Fields throws and throws so accurately so if you have a guy who can go up and make the play as opposed to an economy of St. Brown I think it's the perfect fit but Again, I mean, you watch this game and you see those runs from Tony Pollard. A lot of the time when you have a 50, 60 yard run, more or less what you have is a well-blocked play. And then you have Jonathan Taylor or Kenneth Walker. They find the hole and they have the speed to get through the hole and to beat the players at the second level to keep those guys from being able to get the angle. So it's not a matter of just the blocking because you have to have the vision and you have to have the long speed. To discount those elements is one of the reasons why a lot of fantasy managers will end up with guys like Joe Mixon and Najee Harrison at the end of the season. You know, you feel unlucky because you didn't get the big plays, but you didn't draft the player who could give you those plays. Pollard's runs in this game, I would even take the next step where he beats multiple guys. He is contacted. He fights through some arm tackles. I mean, yeah, none of the individual tackles probably should have brought him down. And yet to beat all of the various tackles, to show the speed, the vision, all of those parts. I I don't know. I mean, I don't have a lot of Pollard because he was kind of right in that range where you need to have the Elliott injury. And I think if you need to have the Elliott injury, I mean, it's a different situation if an injury is a must-have. And that was the same kind of consideration with A.J. Dillon this year versus it'll pay off either way. You're going to win if the starter stays healthy and then you win in a massive way if the starter gets hurt. As you mentioned, we do have him a lot in Dynasty because of it. But Pollard, one of the biggest talents in the entire NFL, this is not merely a matter of those plays being there because of the offense. He he just blew me away how good he looked. And that's going in knowing how good he was going to be. This is just a really cool game for him. Yeah, really awesome game. And Sean, I thought we are going to jump in to the rapid fire round here presented by winbet.com you can sign up today to receive a special sports offer bet 100 dollars, win 100 dollars. download the winbet app now or visit winbet.com to start winning sean the games here i'm going to go through we have some 
really impressive running back performances, some really impressive wide receiver performances. I'm going to go through the games and I'm going to let you talk about who you want to talk about after we have the Buffalo Bills beating the Green Bay Packers 27-17. I talked to you a little bit about this game before we started recording where I, I don't know if it's that the Bills let the Packers stay in it, but the Packers were always trailing really in this one. A few interesting uh officiating calls i guess we'll say with the offensive pass interference that was called on robert tonyan might have been this game a little bit interesting we do have a really strong performance here though by aaron jones now majority of it being on the ground has 20 carries for 143 yards they do carry the ball 31 times in this one of those being an aaron Rodgers scramble which is up a lot I, I talked about their struggles trying to run the ball recently and uh with that they also had a little bit more success in the passing game Romeo Dobbs leading the way in this four for 62 and a touchdown on seven targets a spectacular touchdown catch showing just his ability to track the ball beat the defender make adjustments make the play really impressive and Samaj Touré who isn't somebody who's been involved very often did get four targets in this but he has one reception for a 37 yard touchdown in the fourth quarter a very impressive play by him as a rookie as well Stefan Diggs does Stefan Diggs things Sean he goes six for 108 and a touchdown on eight targets so kind of what we expect there bouncing over then to the the Patriots and the Jets 22 to 17 to New England in this interesting season where the Jets you know coming off a couple of wins you think that they're probably going to go in here and get the W and, and continue to push on but the Patriots get the win nothing really impressive from either quarterback some mind-blowing interceptions thrown in this one where Zach Wilson is trying to throw the ball in it looks like he's just throwing it away out of bounds throws it directly to the Patriots receiver for an interception or not receiver but defensive back uh, we don't get anything really from James Robinson or Michael Carter in this game but we do get Garrett Wilson having his career high in receiving yards he has seven targets 115 yards off six receptions so that was a positive I thought Tyler Conklin looked fantastic in this he got 10 targets which you probably want to see those you know going in different directions but he got six for 79 and two touchdowns and I thought both touchdowns particularly the first one was really really uh well made play from him Jacoby Myers was nine for 60 and a touchdown off 12 targets we get Ramondre Stevenson seven for 72 off eight targets but he also goes for 71 on the ground off 16 carries so Stevenson continues to to lead that backfield in a kind of a 60 40 split with Damian Harris who was involved the entire way through this game take one Thornton not really involved which again a little bit disappointing and Sean I want to bounce over to Monday Night Football and this was one where there is no Jamar Chase you want to see how Cincinnati do with it they did not do Sean <laughs> they they lose 32 to 13 in this and one of those is a, a late touchdown that goes the way of T Higgins he has six targets three receptions 49 yards one touchdown that touchdown was 41 yards so before that he has two receptions for just the eight yards no touchdown so that really did save his fantasy day there Tyler Boyd three for 38 and one touchdown off five targets so really mixed bag here Nick Chubb again doing Nick Chubb things 101 yards two touchdowns for him he also has the two-point conversion and Sean I was very much down on Amari Cooper entering this season and he has done really well i have to say through these opening eight weeks seven targets five receptions 131 yards and a touchdown and he just looks like a different player at the moment than what we've seen in his, his final stint in dallas so that was the three games i wanted to go rapid fire i'm going to take a breath now and get my oxygen back into my lungs but what do you want to head on out of those three games well listeners who <laughs> are invested heavily in the nfl will have obviously watched the monday night game but it was shocking to see the browns absolutely destroy the Bengals in every possible way here to go out and get that dominated physically the Bengals, after a couple weeks where they looked like they were back to being super bowl contenders i mean they're back to, to square one i mean you have to go back to the drawing board and build this thing up completely again they managed to get themselves into a game here where Joe Mixon gets 17 opportunities when you barely have the ball. Throwing him nine targets. Again, we like to have the running backs involved in the passing game, but not Joe Mixon, who is just someone who doesn't give you anything that isn't blocked, that isn't there. To have Jamar Chase be out and have Higgins and Boyd combine for only 11 targets, they both catch a touchdown pass in this game. A couple of the plays that Boyd actually is involved in, you see him elevate and make more impressive 
physical plays, then perhaps a lot of people would anticipate the touchdown for T. Higgins. Again, a very impressive physical play where he elevates over the defensive back. And then when that back falls, he's able to backpedal into the end zone. But one of the things that's the most striking here is the difference in Nick Chubb versus Joe Mixon and what that allows the entire rest of the offense to do because you have Chubb and because you have the ability of these running backs to maintain drives and to actually give you something positive to neutralize potential pass rush as opposed to just desperation plays where, I mean, handing the ball to Joe Mixon is the equivalent of or perhaps worse than just quick kicking, right? So you have Chubb. He has another great game, scores the two touchdowns, but Jacoby Brissett to look the way that he does. And it's interesting, and I think it skews the perception a little bit if you're not able to watch all of the games. And I know most people don't have kind of that time in their schedule. It's not the main thing that they're doing. Because the huge games here from Brissett and then specifically Amari Cooper have happened on national television, it does perhaps inflate a little bit the sense of what they're doing. And yet Amari Cooper is one of the top scoring wide receivers this season. It's hard to inflate it too much. You see a couple of the long plays that he makes in this game. One of the things that I was thinking as I watched the Raiders this week is that with, with Gruden no longer there, they're back to looking like the style of offense where Derek Carr struggled and where Amari Cooper was so bad that he seemed to be done before he moved to the Dallas Cowboys. Then you have those first couple of seasons with the Cowboys where he looks fantastic. His career is revived. He's the guy again, and you can see the difference in coaching and scheme and how he's used within that scheme. And he's back last year. The numbers were pretty bad. And when I say pretty bad, I mean, they, they were terrible in terms of comparing himself to himself. And so you have a player who is not old, but is starting to get older. You have that decline in the peripherals. You have those within the context of an offense where you should be seeing the type of efficiency that he's generating in games this year and the risk going to the Browns, a team that's going to have Jacoby Brissett as the QB and probably struggle to move the ball is significant. And yet people who took that risk definitely have (laughs) gotten the great lottery ticket payoff here. Like you said, he looks completely different. And I think that Jacoby Brissett and Kevin Stefanski, even in a season where, I mean, the Browns are three and five, they're not dominating teams. They, are not they're they're still trailing the Bengals in the standings but some of the specific things that they have done well and you kind of go back and think if key members of their defense hadn't gotten hurt then they probably would have been able to play the way they played on Monday night in more of the games probably would have been able to do the type of damage to some of the other teams that they did to Joe Burrow but again I mean this is a game where Burrow actually looked pretty good in terms of the quick release, getting the ball out there, giving his guys a chance to make plays. But I mean, he's five more sacks. And so you add those in, that makes it 25 for 40 in terms of called pass plays, what they were able to accomplish there. And it just, the the difference in coaching in this game jumped out dramatically. I think you have to give Stefanski and the Browns a lot of credit the Bengals are are one of those teams where every time you get excited about them, they do something like this. Every time you feel like they're about to go down the drain, they bounce back and, and do some things. Well, that's what you should expect when you have Joe Burrow, an elite passer. You've got the receiving talent that they have. The inconsistency, though, is maddening. And after they go to the Super Bowl, everybody on this team is going to get lots and lots of leeway. But the coaching staff needs to make some big improvements. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of coaching staffs, but we have seen some of them make those improvements over the last couple of weeks. But some of them that meant that the head coach had to be moved on. But we'll see what happens, Sean, over the the next couple of weeks. Week eight was a huge amount of fun. I'm hoping that week nine puts us straight into that same category, and we can continue to see some more higher points scoring totals in those weeks ahead. Again, today's show brought to you by Blue Wire and WinBet. You can check out the WinBet app today. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Overtim Arden. My co-host is Sean Siegel. Both of the articles I mentioned at the start of today's show will be linked in today's show notes should you want to head on over and check them out up at rotoviz.com. If you're signing up over there, use the code RVRADIO2022. Get yourself a 10% discount while signing up. And of course, check out all Sean's work while you are there. Until we are back with another episode, have a good one.